I put a Hi, Mark. My make host. I've just done that to you. Okay. Just do a quick print whilst I'm waiting. Almost didn't make it tonight. I have to tell you, it was close. <laughs> yeah, right. What happened? Uh, just one of those days, Peter. <laughs> it's it's why I've it's been... why I don't have a high caliber firearm. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, now it's okay. interesting. It's only got you and me there. I don't know what happened to the others that were there. That there was four that were there, and then they dropped out. Oh, uh, Stephen entered the waiting room. View. Okay. Admit. Admit, admit, admit. Okay, there we go. Good. There we go. You'll just need to keep your eye on that whilst um, yeah. we're going. And it's 6.30, so uh, we might just kick it off. How do you feel about that, Peter? Yep, I Got think we few. should start on time. Yep, good. I like that idea. And past students of mine know that I'm a little bit like that. So we'll get on with it. So the first thing that uh, came up from last. Okay, I just got an email. Somebody's unable to log in. Sorry. Um, yeah, okay. I'll let you sort that out whilst I um, continue. Is that okay? Yep. Peter, are you happy for me to continue whilst you're sorting that out? Yes, I am. Okay. So last uh, thing, one of the things that was discussed is, um, you know, how do you write a persuasive or how do you write a, a, a really good quality arborist report? And one of the things that um, has frustrated me with my report writing skills and with report writing in our profession in general is the use of technical writing. And technical writing is... It's its own unique style or scientific writing, its own unique style. And I was trying to figure out how I could communicate it. And I figured it was really like um, a set of drawers. And my wife's got Alzheimer's, so her world needs to be uh, reasonably well organized. And the more uh, the Alzheimer's progresses, the more that organization is essential. So, um, you know, the top drawer is going to be... Um, socks the next drawer is going to be knickers the next drawer is going to be brassieres and so on all the way down the process and could you imagine what it'd be like for her if she were to open up the top drawer and then find shorts and the next drawer find shirts mixed in with the the knickers it would start to create problems and so that's what we see with a lot of our technical writing is this process of mixing things up so there's a normal sequence or flow and it starts off with um, something in the, the order of a brief or a set of instructions or a purpose. You know, why is this uh, report being written? And in many cases, because we're responding to a client request, it's, it's a brief. That, that is, we're being asked to do something or we're being instructed. So we've been given instructions to do something. Um, in general, the, the instruction would be more likely from a law firm, although um, a brief could be the same. And most cases, a brief is what you'd get from a normal residential client or a, a um, council or commercial client. Within the work environment, if you're a, with a larger employee, you may be given a, um, a set of instructions or you might be given a, um, a scope or a, a purpose for writing a report. And they're all the same thing. What, what's this report about? That's the first bit. Um, the next thing that we want to know is, is how did you go about it? A method. Um, and most frustratingly, the word methodology sounds really suave and sophisticated. So it's the common word that's used for a method. 
but a methodology is actually comparing different methods. So in most cases, our Arborist report should be using the word method. That's just a, a little bit of pedanticism, but it, if we're going to be professional, um, we should be constantly upgrading things. And that's one of the things that our profession uh, definitely needs to upgrade is, is using the word method when it's a method and only using methodology when it's methodology. Next stage is observations. And observations could also include a whole pile of other things. You could title it test results if you're doing a set of tests or something like that. And that's this more formalized component of evidence that you can collect that's irrefutable. It might be from photographs, it might be from aerial images, it might be from historic documents, but this is data that you're gathering or information that you're gathering that um, is, is going to be important. And as we gather this information, as we go through the method, there's a tendency to start putting in information at that spot. So there's a tendency to put in uh, in the method, some of your uh, uh, observations or some of your results. And it's really important that you don't. It's important that in the method, um, method stays as method. And in the um, um, observations, that it's where you keep the stuff that anyone can go out and verify or check. Um, it's got nothing to do realistically with your opinion. So if you're saying, oh, this is a healthy tree, well, I guess that that is an observation, but again, it would ideally be accompanied by why um, or um, some substantiation. But uh, again, it could be um, something that could go in one of two spots there. The next stage is the discussion. That's where you put your information and the information of, more importantly, the experts that you intend to rely upon. And when I was a lot younger arborist, Peter, about... Uh, 10, 12 years ago, maybe a little longer, I thought, you know, a good arborist report was one where I gave the client a whole pile of information and didn't refer to any other outside source because that made me an expert. Um, and I've long since changed my view on that. Um, and I think that answers that question that people were asking earlier on. Um, how do you write um, a really powerful report? One of the ways that's really important is your experts, what experts are you using, what papers are you using. And there are some really great ways to find papers. And um, we'll have a look at some of those tonight, just very briefly, and see how we can add weight to uh, our opinions. So our opinions are good, but our opinions based on an expert who's done some research or some testing or some trials is a lot so better. So by expert, excuse me, Mark, by expert, you're, you're talking about the um, other research papers, published papers that you're going to rely on and cite as... Published papers, published. books, um, conference proceedings, um, you know, there's sort of a, a, a descending order of priority. Um, research papers, peer-reviewed papers are the ideal. Um, books, um, a little bit further down. And then right down the bottom is, you know, things like newspaper articles or internet um, quotes. And those latter group tend to be rather subjective and somewhat unreliable. Um, so you can get some fairly wacko stuff from that end of the world. And- Sounds like it's, um, maybe it even um, could be a good uh, subject for us uh, on another day to, to um, look at in depth. Yeah, yeah, look, um, I'm happy to take that on advisement, Peter. Um, so, once you've gone through the discussion, um, and the discussion is driven in many ways by your brief. If your brief has got uh, a requirement for you to do certain things or address certain things, they would be addressed in the discussion. So if you were doing a risk assessment, they wanted you to come out, inspect the tree and undertake a risk assessment. Well, you'd be talking about your inspection and the consequences of those that inspection. So the tree was uh, found to be in good health. There was no significant... Um, um, factors of concern, um, then your risk assessment should be consistent with that. And there's, again, this general um, need to have a, a flow in your documentation that is consistent. Um, if you're doing an arboricultural impact assessment report, you know, you'd be expected to assess the trees and consider the plans. And so you'd expect to see in, in the discussion subheadings that related to that, you know, um, um, 
basic comments on the trees or discussion about the trees, discussion about the plans, discussion about the impact of the plans. Um, so there's a, a progressive um, style to it. Um, after you've done that, um, then you're going to have some recommendations. And the recommendations uh, may be there or they may not be there. Sometimes where recommendations aren't going to be included. For example, if you're being asked in your opinion of a, a, a tree um, from a risk perspective for the Land Environment Court, you might not include any recommendations. You simply might give an opinion about the level of risk and that would be the end of it. You won't uh, continue on beyond that. Um, so, but there'll be recommendations and a conclusion. And the conclusion should essentially summarize um, what you've been asked to do in the context of the discussion. So um, the tree was healthy. There's no reason to believe that the tree poses an unacceptable risk. Now, that's all very well. That's a nice long process. And um, you can get a template if you want one. Uh, if you email Peter, he'll make sure that it gets to you. I'll send you a link um, to a um, template that you can use that's got the headings on it. Um, here's some other hints that go with it. Data is very hard to read. So if you look at a report, um, and let me just open up one for you um, and share it with you. I'm just going to find out how I do that again. Share screen, yes. Um, where does it say desktop? It doesn't. Why doesn't it? Um, let me try this. Um, Okay, that hasn't shared the screen with you, has it? No. No, mate, you might have to take control of the um, meeting back to do it. No, I didn't last time, Peter. Uh, okay. And I see other ones open. I just don't see that one open. Um, let's share screen. Does that share it with you now? Yes. Okay, so this is a typical report. Um, again, it's got different things in there, but there's a method, uh, discussion, there is up here. Oh, there isn't. <laughs> um, the brief is missing out of that one. That's interesting. Um, but there's data and data is hard to read. And a data would include something like, um, and I don't know what I've got to do here to close that down. Oh, I do, yes, I do, close. Um, yeah, uh, you often see this information in the body of the report. Um, it belongs in an appendix. You can't read um, something like this. It's just, it doesn't flow in the English language. So you've just got a whole pile of numbers and information being thrown at you. And as a result, uh, it gets confusing. So information like that would go in an appendix. Um, you know, your drawings will go in an appendix. Um, so the appendix are where you put information that's not essential. So here I've got a discussion on uh, determining the tree protection zone and how that's coming to development within uh, the industry. It's not um, pertinent to the main uh, body of the report, but it's an addition to the report. Um, so it goes in appendix. Um, I've got some generalized tree protection material and I've got some illustrations to show good work and bad work. And again, there's nothing wrong with any of that stuff. It can be there, um, but it doesn't directly relate to the body of the uh, document. So it's something there that's helpful information to add. Um, so it doesn't go in that first bit. So the first bit just sticks purely with that scientific process. And then there's a table of contents. And I said, I don't know why this one's had the, um, I can't, oh, yes, I can, we'll roll it up. Uh, I don't know why it's had the um, brief eliminated. It was there. Oh, there it is. Yeah, there it's on the wrong page. That's why I couldn't see it earlier on. So the brief, the author has been asked to visit the site, identify the trees present within 10 minutes of the development. So uh, information of the site visit should be there. Information of the trees should be there. Assess existing site conditions. So some discussions on the site conditions. Assess the current health of the trees. There should be a discussion on that if it's pertinent. Uh, perform preliminary tree assessment, assess, discuss, and so on. Is this this brief? And here, 
again, because we're often given information by people, uh, information provider or assumptions would go in uh, so that the reader knows what you're relying upon. Uh, I've had on a number of occasions where a consent authority has got back to me and said, look, Mark, I don't understand why you've said this. It's not consistent with the plans. And as we've gone back and looked at the plan set, the plan set the developer has submitted are completely different to the plan sets that they've provided. And I'd have to say that latter experience happens probably one out of every three development sites that I'm on. At some stage or other, the developer will do a change, plan change and won't have advised me. And therefore, um, I'm writing about some older plans. So the advantage of you listing down your plans, uh, who they're drawn by, what version they are, um, what revision they are, what date, um, just avoids that problem. Um, although I have to say, I do have um, clients that use the same numbering for the plans and their different versions of the plan. So even that can become problematic. Is that something you've experienced, Peter? Absolutely, yes. It's um, sometimes I've, I've just had a project where th that slight difference in plans has caused a three month delay and several thousand dollars worth of additional fees to the client because nobody picked up that they were that the stamp plans were, were different. Yeah, look, and I just um, dealt with a, a site where the plans have been approved, the DA is approved and the remediation plan came through um, because there was some contaminated fill and <laughs> I think my response to the client was crap with a few exclamation marks. I mean, essentially, we need to lower the grade around the tree by 500 mils. And having gone to all the effort to try and keep the tree, the tree now goes, which is unfortunate. So, um, yeah, that's the basic layout of a, a, a report. Now, there's arguments about um, how that should be written in terms of first person, third person. And it's interesting if I'm writing for a court other than the land and Brahma court, I write in first person. That is, it's my opinion. And I believe that. Um, because the land and Brahma court has been more strongly influenced in New South Wales by the more traditional style of writing out of ride, I tend to write those reports uh, in third person. Um, and most reports are right in third person. That's the more technical um, style. But when you're working as an expert for the court, it really is your opinion that you're talking about. And um, that doesn't mean you don't use references and that doesn't mean you don't use the same supporting thing. It doesn't mean you say I all the time, but at some stage or other, you want to write as though you're writing to the judge. And because you're writing to a judge, uh, it becomes um, very personal. I this or I that. Does that help make sense? Yep. So when I say think about a set of drawers, really do think about a set of drawers. One of the things that you need to do when you're editing a document. Just, um, is one, one point I would like to make, Mark, in addition to what you've said, is that the way that you've um, laid this out is just one way of laying it out. There's no fixed rule. You don't have to, for example, the information provided, you don't need to have it in exactly that format. Oh, you just have no. to have the information there. No, what I'd say, say to you to do, Peter, is go out and find good reports, reports that you find easy to read or enjoyable to read or visually appealing. Start compiling them. Um, how that things are laid out, what we call the template, is not covered under copyright law anywhere in the world. So if you find a, a style of presentation, use that to your heart's content. Um, you know, it's, it's what works for you. So, for example, when it comes to the tree protection specifications, a while ago, Parramatta Council said to me, look, if you're going to give us specifications, tell us the reason why. So for me, I, I do all my specifications with a reason why as well, so that, one, I'm hoping to communicate to the consent authority my rationale behind that condition, and also communicate to the, um, the builder and the, the people doing the work what it is, you know, it's not just uh, um, I'm giving you another thing to do, but I'm giving you a thing to do for a reason. Um, so 
um, appoint a project arborist to oversee and certify all works in the tree protection zones. A project arborist needed to supervise overseeing care, um, see, oversee the care and protection of the trees, establish a tree protection zone, ensuring all blah, blah, a copy of the plan and so on, all the way through the process. It's just giving them the rationale behind it. Sometimes it's, it's pretty hard to come up with a, a detailed rationale. Other times it's really easy. And I try and keep them short and pithy. Um, you know, nothing there is longer than three lines or four lines long. And um, well, there, there we are. Nothing there. I find an exception to the rules pretty quickly. Uh, certification should be include a statement on the condition of the retained trees, details of the deviations from the approved tree protection measures and their impacts on the trees. That's from the standard and provide specifications for any remedial or rectification works required. And then why? To comply with the standard, and I'd give the clause there, 5.2. Um, I just give you guys on top, I'll just move you over. 5.5.2 um, provides document record of the final condition of the trees. It audits and certifies um, the correction of any problems. So it's not about um, that being the only style, in fact, I would say if you write like me, you probably are due to get yourself some psychiatric help um, rather than, uh, because it's my style, it's me. And, um, you know, if you're too much like me, you probably do need some form of help because I certainly do on occasions. Um, so, yeah, I, and for me, I, I have that tree protection specifications. I call them a specification now. Um, because of a comment made by Peter Caster. Peter Caster used to have and so did I recommendations. And at one stage, somebody said, well, they're only recommendations, they're not specifications. So I just did whatever the hell I felt like anyhow. And so um, I'm very clear in calling that a tree protection plan specification now. Um, and I'm hoping that with the review of the standard, uh, we will stop using um, this tree protection plan specifications and tree protection plan drawing, and we'll call it the tree protection specifications and the tree protection drawing, rather than uh, using the word plan and then drawing afterwards. So I think that's that just adds confusion. So yeah, a, a, and that that's one style of report, Peter. But you know, you made that comment. Um, it doesn't have to be like that. There are lots of reports that are just um, basic and. I don't know what this one will come up like, but yeah, there we are. It's a school uh, risk report. And you'll see it's just a letter style. It's not got um, the same um, degree of um, information. Um, it's not got the same headings. It's just very basic, but it still follows the same flow. So up front, uh, concerns were raised about the potential harm from trees. So that's um, a part of the client's brief. The trees in the school have been previously inspected by whoever, it doesn't matter, or whatever. And in the process, trees of concerns were tagged in the risk quanti uh, rank quantitatively or whatever it might have been. Um, and then a, an inspection took place on the 4th of May, uh, March 2021. There's a method. Um, so mm -hmm. then I'll put some notes in underneath that. This is just a template in the stage of being worked upon. And again, templates are, are, are invaluable. Once you've done a report, go back, strip out the information that's not so critical and keep on working on those reports to make them um, useful from your side. Um, I so think this might be a good opportunity for me to um, just uh, add in my five cents worth. Please, One of my pet peeves is reports that are overly wrong. And uh, there are a number of people who've um, supposedly um, made this point, people like Churchill, I think was one of them who said something along the lines of, I would have written a shorter letter had I had more time. And um, I've read reports that are, you know, I might be exaggerating, but 75 pages with four pages of legal disclaimer and it's all just puff and fill and the pertinent points are three dot points on page 17. And um, it makes them, uh, makes those reports almost unreadable and basically unusable. That, I think that's a fair comment, Peter, and it's one of those things that um, we want to have 
our report so that it is readable. And so it's take the junk that is in the body of the report, put it at the back in an appendix. Um, but I, I think uh, I shared with a class once, Peter, and you might've even been in that class, a report, I think if I recall, it's 57 pages long. It deals with one eucalyptus scoparia in a bitumous opening in a inner city suburb um, with two felinas fruiting bodies on it. And any arborist would have said, look, the tree hasn't got great longevity. There's questions about structural stability. It's in a higher use area. It's really close to a, a um, strip mall shopping center. Um, you know, the appropriate thing to do is probably consider its removal, um, if not in the shorter term, certainly in the midterm. And, you know, that came out as 57 pages. Um, and it doesn't need to be. Uh, again, I'm, I'm working, writing for a, an RT at the moment, and their template has all their margins um, just left justified. So I'll just change this one here to show that. Um, that's left justified, um, whether it all just comes to an end. Um, it doesn't matter how you want to do it, whatever works for you. Um, and the way that you want to look, make look from my side, I like the nice even sides. Um, but whatever you do, make sure that your paragraphs are clear. So it's a, a line space. Um, in the earlier days, we used to indent a paragraph. We don't anymore. Um, but a line space between or um, a certain number of points between your paragraphs so that you've got a clear break. Now, if you get a paragraph that's really, really, really long, first question you've got to be asking is why. Um, Five-sentence paragraphs are about the norm. Um, seven sentence paragraphs are rare and one page paragraphs are banned by the Geneva Convention as torture. Um, you, you realistically should be looking, how can I break this up? Because your paragraph is based on the first sentence um, okay. and that guides the rest of that paragraph. So you to be able to talk about that first sentence for more than seven um, sentences is just a rarity. So um, looking at how can I split a, a paragraph. The other thing that goes there is in most cases, um, particularly in the discussion, one sentence paragraphs are also obscure. You might get it in the recommendations. You might get it in the brief. You might get it in other sections of the report. But a, a one sentence paragraph in a discussion says you're not discussing it. You're just making a comment. And ideally in the discussion, we would... Um, be discussing something. Um, so that's the layout and the style. And if you write in a style of technical writing, it's known as, or scientific writing, um, the style is a flow of um, what is this about? How did I do it? What do I know? What do I think about what I know? What does that mean in the end or the recommendations? And then a summary of it all. Um, is great. Now, let's talk about the executive summary. If the report is very long, uh, an executive summary can be useful. But there are mixed opinions on that. And I'll quote Adam, Tom, if they're not going to read the entire report, they don't deserve to get an executive summary. And I think there's some merit to that. Having said that, if it's a 70 or 80 page of report, now when I'm saying 80 pages of report, I'm talking about the the body of the report, not the appendices and all that sort of information, but the actual discussion and, and um, observations get up to that sort of 70 or 80 pages, then yes, a page or two of executive summary may be helpful. Um, that's discretionary as to how you do that. You can either do that as discussion. And again, my view of it is any report that is more formal in style will have a table of contents that table of contents will be generated by the software and the, um, the processing uh, material so that's all laid out consistently. And when you change something, all you've got to do is go update field, update entire table or whatever it is based on your software, and it'll go through and adjust the entire um, table of contents so that's all correct. And this tells you the story. If you want to you can go through and say, ah, are there any recommendations in this document. Interestingly, this is a document without any recommendations. The recommendations are, in fact, the tree protection plan specifications. 
So there's no recommendations that the council should approve or not approve this proposal. Um, the recommendations are that in the event that this approval goes ahead, these specifications should be followed. Um, so is everyone happy with that? Yep, yep. not of heads will do for those who've got videos on, great. So the next question then is, how do you get these references and um, how do you get good supporting arguments for what you're saying? I mean, you, you've all been in the situation where you've been asked to do something, you think, I really believe this or I really think this, but I need to get something to substantiate it. And my favourite friend to date in that has been Google um, Scholar. And hopefully I can open my screen and you'll see Scholar. Can you see my um, screen? Mm -hmm. yep. yep, great. Then we're in the right spot. So I've just opened up Google Scholar. And if we wanted to look at something, um, uh, root so, um, roots and allometric, I've just searched on something here and I can see lots of different uh, uh, equations or lots of information relating to my search. So um, is now a process of going through and finding it. Now, if you if you're like me and you go and click on this here and say um, laws for water uptake by plant roots, or well, that's great. I'm relating uh, or working on something like that, and I think that would be fantastic. And I open up the article, and I get an abstract here, and um, it won't allow me to download it. In this case, it looks like it might. No, I've got to purchase the PDF. Damn it! And so I go to that spot, and it's thirty-five or fifty dollars or seventy dollars. There are several things that you can do. First of all, a general Google search for the same phrase um, may result in you finding the article. And the reason why that is, is a lot of authors want to actually get their stuff out there. And so they make it available. And so that would be the first thing I'd start doing is seeing, is there some spot that I can find that? Um, oh, Springer Open. Um, Oh, here you are, PDF, Semantic Scholar. Now, um, particularly if you're studying at the moment, um, you may be able to get um, to these um, specialised ones. And there we are, and I've, I've managed to find it um, by going through uh, um, Scholar. Um, you can subscribe to Scholar if you've been at uh, TAFE and you've still got a TAFE email address or at a RTO. Um, you can actually go and um, if you can re still retrieve your emails, you can go and um, join on to some of these services. Science Direct is one. Um, Scholar is another. Uh, not Scholar. Um, um, Semantic um, is another. Um, so there's four or five of those services. You can just simply subscribe to and they'll help you get access. But um, there's lots of ways. So I've gone from a paper that I would have paid $35 for to a paper that now has cost me nothing and now I can use it. Well, I can sort of use it, but referencing is the next thing that causes grief for everyone or nearly everyone. Uh, who here likes referencing? Hands up. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't think so. I always find that gets a... Uh, well, you can actually ask Google um, Scholar for referencing. So we go to Google Scholar again, and we put the name of the paper in, or we could have been back to where we were originally. There's some inverted commas, and that inverted comma says site. And I go down, and whatever system you want to use, I like the Harvard system. So there it is. I've now got it, copied it, and I just paste it into my references. And so I would do that into my references, and in text, in the actual body of the text, I'd say Bayondini, um, 2008, and that's all I'd put. And then in my references, I'd have the full reference. If you're using um, uh, a Cambridge or a, a, a um, I'm trying to think who else does a footnote. Um, I don't know what the others do in the US. Can't think of it. But a footnote referencing system, then again, you'd put that in your, your uh, footnote. Um, you'd have a one or a two or 10 or whatever the number is. And then at the bottom of the page, um, 
a shortened version of this and the full version at the back in your references. So because footnote referencing um, requires more work, I tend to be lazy and use Harvard, which is a, a quicker and easier system. The legal fraternity do use a footnote um, section. There is a text you can download on how they want to have um, their referencing done. Um, Just to remind again, you, Mark, I, five minutes to go. Yeah, I don't think that's that's critical. So there's there's a way of finding good good references, and then you need to read. Um, you need to read the paper. Don't just read the abstract. Read the whole thing and say, what does it really say? How does it relate? And how can I use that information now? In the event it says something that you don't like, you need to use it. Okay. It's really a powerful, powerful report. Is one that considers both opinions for and against or evidence for and against something and weighs them up. They're the most uh, difficult reports to write. They're, they're the most effective because you've already set all the ducks up and shot them down in your discussion. And so when someone wants to say, but what about, they're not going to introduce the new evidence. You've already done that. You've already said, look, you might think this and here's what this paper says. So, for example, we talked about TR and Matic. Matic says that TR approaches somewhere around about the point three. Um, you know, traceability starts to increase. Well, you might say, well, look, Maddox says that. However, Bond, in discussing the same issue, looks at it alternatively and says this. And furthermore, Maddox points out that at uh, trunk drivers of 0.85 on eucalypts in Australia, based on Tasmanian research, um, failure doesn't seem to increase. In fact, um, TR ratio is, is basically ineffective over... 0.85. So if you're dealing with a big tree with a big cavity, you've addressed all the arguments and given you a reason why you've you've pulled your final position. Uh, that doesn't mean that someone's going to not able to disagree with you, but it's a lot harder to di disagree when you've already raised the matter and um, presented reasons why it's not effective uh, or why that that's not the position you hold. Does that help people figure out referencing a little bit better? Certainly, uh, being able to just cut and paste your referencing in is a lot easier. And um, if that's not coming up at the bottom of your Google Scholar page, um, you can set that in your Scholar settings. Um, so if you want to know how to set it in your Scholar settings, um, ask Google. Um, Google will explain to you how to do that. So just say, how do I include uh, citation um, points and um, other bits and pieces. And then we see there are actually six versions of that article and uh, or that paper. Um, and all of them are in the same publication. Sometimes they'll change um, an article slightly between different publications. So um, we can keep that in mind too. Anything else on, on um, that that you want to discuss, Peter? Any questions no, from the audience? Okay. Please rise. No questions, but um, sides of the argument. We've had this discussion before, Mark. It's um, it definitely pays a lot, especially as an expert, um, and goes towards your objecti objectivity. I said Ab that wrong. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. It's 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 yep. one of, but it's the hardest part for us all to do is to say. Well, this is what one position says. This is what a pos other position says. And here's why I, as the expert, have taken this position. Then. And it really is difficult. Um, guys, we've got uh, one minute to go. So I'm going to say goodbye. Um, I will, um, with Peter, sit down and figure out what we're going to do at next meeting and get it done. And I've just finished doing a whole pile of um, um, writing for an RTO. So now I've got a little bit of time spare. Um, so I'll get the videos edited and we'll make those publicly available through uh, Arboz. So you'll all be able to go on and listen to this later on or share it with others, uh, share it with students, uh, however you want to use it. Thanks, guys, for being here and I'll catch you next time around. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you.